My projects are always series of images. I think that individual images in a way don't matter that much. It's when you see the groups, the set of images, you know, that a pattern emerges to form a narrative. Or so whether it's just seeing the different clothes that people wear to different concerts and their makeup or the different bedrooms that children have around the world. Or looking at chimpanzees' faces with lighter skin to darker skin to freckles. You're letting people compare and therefore I think tell a larger story. I'm James Mollison, I'm a photographer. I live in Venice, in Italy. I studied documentary photography. I suppose where my heart is, is the books that I do. And then I also do commissioned and some commercial work. I got here because I went to Fabrica. Fabrica is a centre for creative research funded by Benetton, where they also have Colours magazine. It was started by Oliviero Toscani. And it's really this place that's kind of halfway between a college and halfway between an agency. I got there, just a good friend was there, and uh, my friend said, do you want to come out and visit me for the carnival? And uh, I came and uh, ended up meeting Oliviero. And he said, oh, you want to move to Italy? So yeah, I moved out to Italy a couple of weeks later, and I've been here getting on for like 10 years now. <laughs> so I felt that for the first couple of years, I didn't really create anything that was any good until uh, we started to work on colors. And then that was a moment where we got to travel to some interesting places and began to do some interesting work photographically. The first one was, I think, going to the Lacoli refugee camp and we went to that camp and we spent three weeks uh, in the camp and I think made a kind of quite a solid body of work. I then would work on other, you know, from other issues, from the prisons issue to old age to, you know, taking pictures and I think each one was kind of went in depth into these communities. Um, I've just started to work again with Colours with Patrick Waterhouse. He's the art director and I'm a consultant creative on it. The last issue we were in Libya, you know, looking at how the rebels have been customising their cars. You know, what do you do when you're a rebel army that doesn't have any tanks, you're going up against Gaddafi. I think we're looking at trying to do the magazine which becomes more socially engaging again. Getting a little bit, some of the fun back into colours as well, as well as it being serious. The, the, the projects that are most important to me and I think the most interesting medium as a photographer for showing stuff is the book. And I, I learned quite early on that getting people to commission you to do your ideas just doesn't happen. So I found that the best way is just to do it yourself. And uh, the first project that I did was James and Other Apes, which is 50 portraits of the great apes, chimpanzees, gorillas and orangutans. Um, and that had really just come from an observation. I'd been watching a wildlife programme on primates and I was looking at them and I was thinking, God, their faces are quite similar to our own. And then I was thinking about how actually with animals, you know, in general, you tend to think of them quite generically, not as individuals. So I thought, I wonder if I apply this idea of the passport photo. I wonder if you'll see them as having different identities. This was a little Aaron who was an 11 month old uh, chimpanzee, Katie. She had been kept in a uh, box by a hunter for the first few months of her life and she was like seriously disturbed. The project took me about three years, although probably only five or six weeks actually taking pictures. It was getting the permission that was very difficult because I didn't want to use long lenses. I wanted to be in with the animals. I wanted there to be an intimacy within the portraits. And then with the, uh, some of the gorillas had been re-released into the wild, so I'd had to trek in Congo to find them. All of the apes that I photographed, except for two of them, had their parents butchered in front of them for the bushmeat trade or for the live pet trade. So there's this second reading, which is about their plight. 
Well, I think as a photographer, you're always working on kind of quite a few things at the same time. The next thing that came out in terms of the book was The Disciples, which in a way was the natural progression to the Ape project. I think with the apes, I'd been kind of interested in looking at individuals within groups of animals, whereas with the disciples, I wanted to look at how individuals formed groups to create an identity. It's 58 montaged pictures taken outside concerts around, mainly in the UK and America. And I tried to kind of cover all genres, you know, and kind of give a real sense of the kind of the different people that listen to music. This is probably my favourite image, which is uh, Rod Stewart. And in a way, it's kind of was more interesting than bands like Marilyn Manson, where in a way you'd kind of expect it. But with Rod Stewart, is you know, it was kind of less uh, uh, less obvious as a subject. The projects that I do tend to be these typological projects, which have quite a rigorous way of working, where I set out a set of rules and then I'll follow those. So Where Children Sleep is 56 portraits of children and then their bedrooms. You know, we're all supposed to be born equal, but that clearly isn't true. So I thought if I photograph the children equally on this playing background and then their bedroom separately, you'll get this kind of sense of the bedrooms will talk about their situation. Jazzy, who I photographed in Kentucky, she had um, all of these crowns and her mum was saying how she'd entered a hundred beauty pageants. She also said that it cost about an average of $1,000 for each pageant to enter, which meant the mum had spent $100,000 on pageants. Jazzy's only four years old. I made a kind of conscious decision with, with nearly each child is chosen specifically to tell a story about their particular circumstance. And that's the uh, map of the world of the places we went to and photographed at. I mean, I do, I do kind of a range of stuff as a photographer. I don't know how you can do it other, any other way. I mean, unless you have a trust fund, you know. I do portraits for magazines, some of celebrities, people in fashion. I've done, you know, campaigns for Nike. So. Really, it's kind of whatever comes up. And sometimes you're doing assignments which are great, and other times you're doing assignments which you're doing just because you need to kind of, you need to pay the bills, and you need to be able to fund those other projects you're doing. So we're going out to visit the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, close to the Somali border which has been in the news a lot. The white backgrounds, if we've got the space. They're talking of a, a new famine. They're calling it the worst humanitarian disaster in the world right now, affecting Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Northern Kenya. When Vice asked me to do something about the news, something that was happening, I thought, let's go and see, let's try and see, learn a little bit about these people, you know, I don't know what this is going to be like. And I've been in refugee camps before, but I've never been to an actual famine situation. So for me, it's going to be a completely a new experience. The UNHCR have told us that you need to have a permit to go in. We haven't got that, <laughs> you know, so we're going to be, you know, we're just going to be seeing what happens on the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Nairobi. So we arrived in Nairobi on Tuesday night and then set off at 6am for Didab. One of the most important things when you're going to places like this is getting a good car. I normally actually drive myself but in this situation we're going close to the Somali border, people have been kidnapped, you need to have somebody who knows the local area. Uh, we picked up Mohammed in Garissa, our translator. Hey, hey, Jay. All of our team are 
Somalis born in Kenya. So what are we going to do for Mohammed? We got two Mohammeds. Yeah. We met you first. I call you I call you Mo and I call you Hamed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And we got Ibrahim who's just generally helping out. The drive was was about eight. It was an eight-hour drive, and then we made it to Dadaab at around four o'clock, which gave us a chance to go out and kind of get a little bit of a sense of the place. Dadaab is a refugee camp where you have Somalis who came here in 1992. That's when the camp was founded, and now you've had a lot of people leaving Somalia to flee from the drought and also from the security situation. So in, so in the market here, they have everything. You have restaurants. Yeah. So, which is the good restaurant, Mohammed? The, I think the camp is interesting because in some ways it seems very rural when you see it. It seems like this kind of desert scrub. But actually, when you look a bit closer at it, it's more like a city. You've got the downtown centre part which have barber shops, there were cameras shops, electrical shops, and then there were kind of a market area. Can you see anywhere where we could get a bit higher to do like a kind of landscape shot of like those water towers? And then as you radiate out from that, you have the houses of the refugees who have been here a longer time. And then as you keep on going, you get to the refugees who have been for a little bit less time. And then once you go further and further out, it's the really new arrivals who had much more basic kind of dome-like structures. Uh, but it goes on and on the camp. The next morning, the first thing we did was go to MSF who had arranged the permit from the Kenyan government. So how long have you been working here? I've been working here for eight months. As a doctor? Yes, as a doctor. Tell me a little bit about the camp. How big is the camp? As of now, uh, UNHCR estimates to be about 370,000 inhabitants. 370,000. How big is it supposed to grow? What is the forecast? Uh, due to the trends that we are seeing now, we expect that by the end of the of the year, we'll have more than half a million inhabitants half in the three camps. Yeah, way beyond its capacity. Mm. So Tadab was originally built for less than 100,000 people, um, and while we're here, apparently a thousand refugees are arriving each day as an average. From MSF, we were able to get this permit, and we went first to an area where they had quite a lot of new arrivals, took the white background out and photographed some of, the, some of them out on the street. Uh, I think the white background for me is really that taking them out of their location. I think that, you know, it's this dusty, arid desert, which actually isn't bad as a photographic backdrop. But I think to kind of take them out, it really becomes just about them. And how long did it take him to walk here? 25 days. On one level, I want my photographs to work on an aesthetic level where within them they've got the information to tell the narrative, to tell the story, and they, they stand in their own right. But it is also important to have texts with them that give you other layers of information. So for me it's kind of often very important that you interview the people, that you have those kind of other layers of information. <laughs> yeah, now what I want to do now is go to their houses to okay. see where they live. Well, the shelters kind of seem to change. You know, the very basic ones are these domed ones that are made with bent branches. You go in and just to see how few possessions people had. I mean, I did ask one of the guys what he brought and he said, you know, he didn't, couldn't bring anything really. He just brought the clothes on his back and came with his children. 
Yes. How's it going? Where did you learn English? Yes, I've learned at school. Yes, so. What do you want to do when you grow up? I want to take to USA. You want to go to the USA? Yeah. I come from USA. No, I come from England. And you? I was born in here. Born in the refugee camp? Yeah. So are you Somalian or are you Kenyan? Me? Yeah. I'm a Kenyan person. So. Kenyan, Kenyan. I was born in Kenya as well. Kenya is good. Yeah, good country. Yeah, I was born in Kenya. I lived there till I was five. My mum was born there. My granddad went out as a missionary in the 1930s. I think my dad shot some Super 8 footage of us while we were in Kenya. I think that memory of, of when you're a young kid, a lot of it is, if I actually think about it, is tied up in that Super 8 footage. I mean, I, do, I can remember when I was about three and a half walking down the street uh, with my mum holding her hand and asking her why I wasn't black and everybody else was black around. <laughs> I've gone back. Uh, I've gone back a lot of times. I've got kind of made some friends there. So I've gone back for assignments, um, and then I've gone back for holiday as well. It's a fascinating place. So the next day started by going back to MSF and MSF showed us around the hospital that they're running at the camp and we saw some incredibly malnourished babies. What's your what's your uh, son's name? And when did she arrive in the camp? Last month. And how far did she have to walk to get here? Build on. I think that I felt that what tried to do through these portraits and these interiors is give a sense of this camp. So to give a sense of people who have been here the 20 years, some who've been here a, sh you know, a shorter time and some people just a month or a few days. I think that within that story, this mother with her baby that, you know, is so close to death is an important part of the story of what's happening here. And it felt right and it felt as though it was needed within the series. And why did she leave? <laughs> when did the last rain come? Two years, two years. Two years. And you know, that was pretty tough really. And you know, you re I didn't really feel as though it's the moment to kind of, you know, trying to take a picture, but I think it was important and the mum wanted it. And then the mother also, I think, seeing the Polaroid, she was happy about that. I'm always slightly uncomfortable about these situations because I think that there can be this very negative view of Africa. I mean, often, it's the image that we see. We see the famines, we see the wars, we see the bad things that are happening. And I think there's this paradox between, on the one level, promoting this idea that journalists do of Africa in a place of need, and charities do it, of course, as well, and being part of that. But then there's this other thing where actually Africa isn't reported on enough. But I do think it's important to show different things that are happening because I think I see it more as like you're throwing into, into the debate. So after, after that we went towards the market area to try and meet some of the refugees who've been for a longer time and we parked the car and began to look around and there was this gate with the Kenyan flag and it was the compound of this guy called Insha who was a 21 year old. Uh, there was this brightly coloured toilet block which had been painted in the corner and then we went through there was a, a house and he'd painted various things on the side with I love you and hearts and flowers and it turned out he was getting married the next day. 
tell me a little bit about the I Love You house. <laughs> What, what's her name? Her name is Fami. He'd come to the camp when he was just two or three years old and he's going to be getting married to a girl also from the camp the next day. So thank her very much. Thank you. For me, that's a, that is the mo one of the most amazing things about being a photographer. I perhaps wouldn't have gone on there, gone there on my own, but to be asked to go there, you know, it gives you a reason. I always feel incredibly privileged to be able to go into a situation like that. But, you know, I'm allowed to leave it. You know, I've got that passport. I can fly back to Europe. Perfect. Yeah, we can call it a day. You know, photography is, is this key into experiencing the world.